How are you all doing tonight? Great. Beautiful, beautiful. How's the temperature in the room? Great. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> all right, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and start um, our Bible study. Uh, we're at chapter 3 of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, but before we get deep into the word, uh, let's uh, all bow our heads and look to the Lord. Uh, Heavenly Father, once again, we, a few of your children, have assembled ourselves in an effort to better understand your will for our lives so that we may live lives that are uh, the, the kind that will bring joy to your heart. And we ask you, Father, to give us understanding of your word and, and, and allow your Holy Spirit to lead us so that we may persevere no matter what obstacles stand in our way that we can present ourselves to the world in a way that brings honor to your name. And we ask your blessings upon each and every one that is in this room on tonight. Uh, we pray your blessings upon the sick and the shut in. The Lord, you will continue to guide and watch over each of us. We thank you, Father, for these blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. A little background music to uh, get you in the right mood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're in uh, John 3.18, okay? Uh, before we move forward, are there any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Any questions about anything from last week? Okay? Yes? Oh, you're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. And uh, we will... Uh, she said, thank you for the, 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 the baskets of produce. We will have more boxes coming in tomorrow. So if anyone wants to stop by and get a box, we should be ready to start handing them out around 2 o'clock. So if anyone here wants one, or if you know of someone that's in need, uh, please don't hesitate to send them by uh, so we can uh, make sure we take care of our, our people. Okay? Any other questions about anything um, about chapter Three, any questions? But I appreciate that. Thanks, too, though. Any, any questions about anything in chapter three? No? Okay, let's roll with it. All right. So in chapter three, um, uh, 18 says this My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. And so what the. Um, what, what, what John says then is something that we all uh, believe in, uh, but we don't always get, right? So what John says is that, hey, listen, I, don't, I, I do not, um, you're, you're telling me that you love me uh, is not what I desire. What he's saying is that your actions should show me that you love me. Because anyone can say the words, but that don't mean that that's what they mean as far as what they truly, their relationship with you. So what John says is that if, if your words don't uh, uh, serve as a, uh, a prelude to action, then what you have said is of none effect. And he's saying that in fact, that the way that I can uh, be assured that I truly am um, grounded in the word is because my actions do show love that if my actions don't show love for my fellow man, then I need to go back and check myself because something is not quite right, okay? Now, uh, it says, for if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Uh, let me ask y'all a question right quick. Is it, does it seem like it's an echo in this room to you guys? You might want to bring the volume on just a little bit because there's not a lot of people in here. So he says, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. So what does this mean then? If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. What does that specifically mean? Well, it's, it's, it's simple. And 
that okay for the body? Okay. What that means is simple this, right? How many times have you questioned because of your behavior if you were truly an example of what God would have you to be? Does that ever happen to anybody? Yes, some hands going up, all right? Now, so what he's saying, what John is saying is that, you know, for most of us who are Christians, we know we are not perfect, right or wrong. Right. And since we know we're not perfect, there are some times when we will look back at some of our actions, and because of our actions, our heart will tell us that we are on a road that will cause us to bust hell wide open. Okay? And all of us have been there before. Even after you got saved, you felt like, you know what, this might be the one that I don't know if God can really forgive me for. Or you may have found yourself in a position where something bad was happening, and in your mind, your heart was telling you that you're in this position because God is upset with you. You know, that you did something wrong, and that's why you're going through all this stuff. But what he's saying is this, is that even though your heart may tell you you're not saved because of something, if you have exhibited what Christ says is love for your fellow man, then doesn't God already know enough about you to know whether or not you are worthy of being with him? He does, right? And it is not you who determines if you're worth. You don't determine if you're worthy of being with God, right? If you didn't know that, I'm telling you, you don't make the determination. God makes the determination. And, and what, does he, what does he make the determination based on? Your heart. And what about your heart? Does he use to make the determination? Your love for who? Your love for your brethren and... Right, because your love for the brethren is not how you get saved. Your love for the brethren is what is the um, evidence that you are saved. But your love for him and your acceptance of Jesus Christ is what saves you. So what John is saying here is that if your heart tells you that, you know, let's say, for example, you have a habit that the world tells you is sin, sinful, right? For the sake of argument, you know, like if, you, if you're not, if you are, if you're Pentecostal, for example, I mean, you're, anybody have ever been Pentecostal? Okay, so if, if, you, if you know the Pentecostal tradition or, or holiness, anybody ever been to a been holiness, holiness church? Okay, because some of you may not equate Pentecostal and holiness, but they are the same. Okay, Church of God in Christ, you know, stuff like that, right? Okay, now, if, if you're a member of Pentecostal uh, background, um, can you stand in the parking lot and smoke a cigarette? Why not? Because why? Because that's sin, right? You smoke cigarettes, somebody's going to slap you, and they're going to pray for you, going to anoint you, and, and they're going to have to call the pastor and two deacons out there straighten you up, right? Because you're smoking, you're going straight to hell, right? Now, so let's say you were Pentecostal and, you, and, you know, this kind of thing. Then, you know, you, you come to the Baptist church, and you, you kind of, you know, you, 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 you try not to smoke anymore, but you, you, some tension come up, you know. And after tension come up, you light a cigarette up to so kind of like let it all out. Okay? Now, then your heart be like, oh my God, you know you ain't supposed to smoke a cigarette because that's a sin, right? Your heart will tell you that. He's saying that God is greater than your heart because God knows your salvation was not based on whether or not you smoked a cigarette, it was based on your love of Him and your acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So he says, if your heart does condemn you, God is greater than your heart. Okay? We good? All right. Then he says this. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Right? So if I do something like that and my heart does not condemn me, what he's saying is my faith in God overrides what I have done because I understand now that I am saved by the blood of Christ, and that blood of Christ is what cleanses me or gives me forgiveness of sin. Okay, everybody got that? So, but that's not a license to sin, right? It's just recognizing that what, if I do fall, and my heart doesn't tell me you're going straight to hell, if I'm still happy about my, my salvation, it's because now I understand more about what 
salvation is all about. That's John's point. Okay? He says, and whosoever we and whatsoever, excuse me, we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, right? So it, whether our hearts condemn us or not, he's saying, because of our relationship with God, whatsoever we ask of God, he will give us because we keep his commandments, right? Now, then he lays out what that commandment is. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So as I mentioned to you earlier, now, those are the two things that John says everything boils down to, right? That you believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that you love one another as you have been told to love one another. And he that keepeth this commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him, and whereby we know he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Okay? Now, why would he say we know this by the spirit that he has given us? It's because God has given us a spirit of love. Okay? And the next chapter goes into more detail about that. But how do I know I have a spirit of love? And that's a question I'm throwing out at you. How do we know we have a spirit of love? Right? And how do you, and you're absolutely correct. And how do you know from just everyday living that that spirit of love is in you? It's really a simple answer. It's not real. Because what now? Right, because there is a change in how you deal with folk, right? If, if, if you deal with people the same way you dealt with people before you got saved, then you have no evidence of your salvation. That's, that's what he's talking about. Because before you got saved, you did not adhere to the commandment to love everybody. Did you? No. When you get saved, then that's the commandment to love everybody. So that he's saying what? That if you do that, if you do those two things, right? If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if you deal with that commandment that you have to love your neighbor as yourself, then what you ask of God, you will get, and you know that you are saved because that spirit of love will be in you. Now, does that mean that you will not treat somebody bad? No. no. But what it does mean is if I do treat you bad, I will feel guilty. Because I know I'm supposed to love you. But he's saying, if I do feel guilty about it, okay, don't get all bent out of shape because you feel guilty. Why not? Because, right, because God is greater than my guilt. And he knows that, listen, I really do want to love you, but I'm just a human being. And even though I'm trying hard to love you, you're just such a trifling individual. <laughs> That I don't care how hard I try, I can't seem to break through. And, you know, because that's the reality, right? Because we are not God. We are not Jesus, right? So there are people, and if we are honest about it, there are people that you have truly tried to love. You know, but for some reason, you just can't quite make the breakthrough. All right? You know, you can keep feeling guilty about it. And, like, people will come up to me and ask me that, those types of questions. But pastor, they did this to me. I mean, have I really got to hug them? You know, why? The reason you're asking the question is why? Because there's a guiltiness in your heart that says, I should hug them and forget it. But the reality is, it's not easy to forget pain, is it? So if someone has pained you, you, you know you ought to forgive, because the Bible says what? If they do the same thing 70 times, 7 in a day, you're supposed to forgive them. So in your, your mind is saying, forgive them. Your heart is saying, that's too much pain. I, I'm trying, but I can't let it go. And so John is saying, and within those cases, God is greater than your heart. Don't worry, God got you. He understands your dilemma. It doesn't mean he doesn't want you to love. It just means he understands that in this case, it's difficult for you to do. Okay? Now, so what do you do then in those instances? How do you get beyond that? So you can live in that commandment the way God wants you to live. As anyone, I've told you this once before, but I'm just going to throw it out again to make sure that you all pay attention a lot. 
Does it, has anyone figured out how to make that happen? How can you love people who have despitefully used you? How can you love people who have brought you pain? Say again. Says, what does it mean to love at a distance? Okay. Huh? Forgive. Don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Right. That's the easiest thing to do. And that, I mean, that's been different. That is, that is really what the Bible teaches us to do. Right? Remember what you did Ephesians where it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood? Yeah. That's saying what? The problem is you are tying the action to the person. And, there, and the Bible is telling us, no, your, your, your anger should not be directed at the person, but against the action that they did. And who calls them to do the action? Who? Say it. Satan, right. And the Bible says what? The action is caused by the evilness in man's heart, which is a worldly thing. So if I if I understand that, then I will I don't have to hate you, but I can't hate the action. I can love you but still hate what you did. Now, let me tell you how easy that is. Okay. How many of you parents hate some of the things your children have done? Every last one of you who got a cow hates some of the things your child has done. And if you say, and if you didn't admit it, according to the Bible, you are a liar, and the truth ain't in it. Okay, because all of us that have children hate some of the stuff our children have done, but we don't hate our children, right? We still love them because we can separate their actions from who they are. But when it comes to other people, we don't do that. And that's what he's saying that we need to do. Okay, that makes sense to you? Yeah. All right. So any questions on chapter 3? Okay. Yes. that so everybody will hear what you're saying. But before I do that, let me remind my, my, my frontier people, my front row people. There you go. <laughs> the, the deacons just informed me when we were out in the, uh, in the, uh, in the parking lot uh, to remind you all that if you're in the church, uh, unless you are singing or, or actively speaking, to please keep your mask on. Okay? Keep your mask on. And also to remind you as well, if, if you if you, are, if you and an individual are not personally connected to one another, then please don't ask someone to let you sit beside them because that is infringing on their, their, their space of safety, okay? So, you know, if, if you know that that person that the ushers tell you to sit beside is not someone in your family or someone that you are intimately, you know, connected to, that y'all ride together, something like that, then just remind the usher that, you know what, they may be my friend, but I didn't ride with them, I don't sleep in the same house with them, and I don't trust them. <laughs> so sit me somewhere else, okay? Because the ushers may not know that, but you need to protect you and the other person, okay? And that's what we want to do it that way, so we can make sure we protect everybody, okay? So, now, your statement was right on clue, and right on point, right? She said that, hey, that there are times I have to check myself and recognize what? I have done worse to God than you have ever done to me. And he still loves me. And, and, and I say not just worse to God. I have done worse to my mother than anybody has ever done to me. You know, because I have done things that put tears in her eyes. You, you know, and, and I can't think of any of you all who ever caused me out of anger to cry. Now, I, I've cried over some of you guys because I was thinking how this is not this group, okay, but some other groups. I have cried because I think myself, these are the craziest people in the world. I can't believe they did this. You know, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like you know when people are doing something that's so outlandish, it just hurts your heart because you know they're hurting themselves. I, I've I've shed tears at night over that, but not because someone has hurt me. The, you know, the only person I've shed tears that, that hurt me has been my mother, 
you know, other folk, I get mad. I don't get, you know, like tears. It's like, I want to cut somebody, but not, you know, you want to cry over them kind of deal, right? But, but the, so that's what I'm saying. You know, for me, I, I've hurt my mother more, you know, than I've hurt anybody else. So, and she still loves me. So I should love others who hurt me. You know, because there's really no comparison to the pain I put her through. You know, I mean, I straightened up when I got a little older. You know, but you know, when I was young, it was a whole lot of pain. You know, how, how many, how many of you ever put your child out the house? Right, so that's a whole lot of pain, right? Them joke got to really messing up. You say, get out, don't come back, right? And and that's what my mother told me on more than one occasion. And admit it too, get out and don't come back, okay? And I stay gone for like you know six months or so, and then come back for dinner and then forget to leave. You know, stuff like that. Okay, all right. So we're in chapter four, right? We're in chapter four. And here's how we begin chapter four. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into this world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come is in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So he he tells us, listen, every body that is preaching a religion is not the spirit that you ought to follow. Now, I'm going to uh, take a gospel liberty and expand that in two different ways, okay? Number one, that is why, this is my first point, you have to be extremely weary of tele-evangelists, okay? Now here's why I say that, because when I'm watching most tele-evangelists, not all, but most of them, they have the same basic principle, sow a seed, get a harvest. Right? It is so a seed, and then they'll bring up some folk to testify about how they sold the seed, they sold their last $1,000. They got a check in the mail for $25,000. Right? That's always, it's always something out in the oil. They sold the seed, and then their grandmama died and left them a million dollars. It's always something. Okay? Uh, what does that got to do with salvation? Not one thing. Okay? So they're not preaching Christ. They're preaching a false sense of prosperity. So for me, those preachers, that that's all they do is spend the entire 30 minutes talking about how you need to send them money so you can be blessed with more money. That's not a Christ-centered message. And so for me, that's an anti-Christian way of preaching, and that's the anti-Christ. Okay? Anybody, anybody that's not preaching Christ first, as far as I'm concerned, and according to what John says, is anti-Christ. Right? And so you need to try those spirits. So for those of you who may be giving money to those kind of those kind of ministries, you need to take your money and put it back in your pocket, okay? Because all you're doing is throwing it out the window. As a matter of fact, it's been some time ago. 60 Minutes did a expose on televangelists, okay? When they did an expose, they went, and I don't I don't remember the preacher's name, you know. But in any event, they went to that. To, the, to that uh, location, and they tried to get an interview with that preacher. The preacher would not give them an interview. They noticed while they were there that someone was going to the back with bags. They looked like they were full of paper, okay? They go to the back, and what they find is what people were doing, they was cutting them off those open, taking the money out, and just throwing stuff in a bag and putting the bag in the trash can. They were not reading the envelopes. They were not doing what they said they were going to do, which is pray over every envelope. All they did was take the money out, pray it over the money, and put the, the, the uh, prayer request in the trash can. Okay? Try every spirit. Okay? Anybody that tells you some stupid stuff, run. I'm telling you right now. Run. Okay? Now, do I believe in prophecy? Yes. Do I believe in most of these prophets that are running around here talking about they are prophets? No. Okay? I am so tired of people trying to tell me what my future is in the name of the Lord. All right? 
Because all of them got that same old line. I see greatness in front of you. Okay. Now what? <laughs> you know? I see a blessing coming your way. Okay, I wake up every morning. That's a blessing that came my way. Right? So, you know, so I'm saying, you know, or I know you've had some pain in your life. Well, who has not had some pain in their life? Okay? And, and here's the bottom line. Why do I need you to tell me where I have been? I know where I have been. Okay? Now, as I said before, now I keep saying it to the day that the Lord take me home. And the Lord knows me. Okay? If you want to prophesy to me, I want one simple prophecy. I want to know what them five numbers is in the calendar. That's all you need to tell me. And if that come up, I'm going to believe that you are a true prophet of the Lord. Okay? And in fact, if that happens to me from any of you all prophets, I'll give you half the money. Just to prove to you I love you as much as, you know, you told me you love the Lord. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, his question was, do I think that's why people don't come to church? I think that's why people are turned off by religion, but I don't think that's why people don't come to church. I think most people don't come to church because um, we who are in the church have given people a false sense of what it means to be saved. You know, I think if we were, if church people were honest with people, I think people would come to church more. But church people aren't honest. See, if nobody in here is totally honest with people. No, nobody. You know, everybody hiding some dirt, right? But see, when you're not in the church, you don't hide your dirt. You you you, you brag about it. <laughs> Think about it, right? If you, if you got if you if you got three girlfriends and you're not in the church, oh, you bragging about that? Yeah, man, I got one in North, I got one in Suffolk, and I got one in Portsmouth. And no, not one of them know I got them. And all of them be paying my bills. So you brag about it. Now, when you sing on the choir, right, and you got a girlfriend on the usher board, you got a girlfriend on the missionary board, and you got a girlfriend on choir number two, you ain't telling nobody, right? You ain't bragging, so you hiding it. But everybody see y'all in the parking lot talking all the time. So we know what's going on. So people on the outside, we're portraying this sense of perfection. I mean, of course, you know, I'm, you know, take it to the nth degree. We portray this as a per perfection that turn people off. We need to be honest with people. You know, straight up. You know, just like um, um, ch church folk drink liquor, right? Church folk drink liquor, but church folk don't like it. They lie about it. No, I this is for medicinal purposes only. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's true. So, what do you mean? They hide. You know, they hide. You know, they hide it. You know. So church folks smoke cigarettes. Church folks smoke pot. Church folk go to clubs. Church folk fornicate. Right? Yeah. Church folk cheat. I'm not telling you to brag on your sin. I'm saying, what well, you know, if we were honest about it, if, if, if we would tell people what the church is truly about, people would not mind coming to church. And then if they came to church, if we stopped looking at them so strange because they came, and stopped talking about them when they came, and stop treating them like they shouldn't be here, you know, we stop people from wanting to come because we will get high and mighty at times. You know what I'm saying? So if, the, if, if this is what we say to people, and I know it's not the text, but it is love, so we might as well stand for just a little while, right? No. If you, you know, I say this, I say this all the time. If we tell people, come as you are, why do we keep getting upset that they came that way? We tell you, come as you are. But if she come in here and she's showing everything, all the married women mad. Look at her coming in here. Look at her with her hussy self, trying to tempt the pastor like that. Why are you worried about them tempting me? That clean me and my God. <laughs> And if my heart condemn me, <laughs> then my God is bigger than my heart. <laughs> but I'm just saying, but y'all don't tell you the truth. Yeah, right. Right? That, 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 that's the truth. And so I'm saying, we, you know, we are the ones that, you know, kind of make people feel uncomfortable 
if they if, when they come. But if we were different, they would think different. You, you know. And so that that's the whole because Jesus did not condemn people, remember? When Jesus caught the woman in adultery, what did he tell her? He said, I don't condemn you. He just said, go and sin no more. That's all. Right? Yes. That's okay. To a message, and and you can tell I'm not at the end yet, by by how I am is where how I told you where I'm trying to take you, but I'll look at my watch and say, oh, sorry, I gotta stop. I'll, I'll finish it up some other time." She's saying, "Don't stop, keep rolling, because if the Holy Spirit is directing traffic, then that means what? There's no stop sign. And if the Holy Spirit got a green light, keep going, okay? Uh, and I don't have a problem doing that, but I will tell you why I stopped. It's because I was taught when I was in school one simple concept, and that is God is a manager of resources, and that God has only 24 hours in everybody's day. So I was always taught that time is the most precious resource you can have, so be respectful of everybody's time. Because what you're saying is true, some people may be like, well, yes, keep going, but some people may be like, you've gone far enough. So that's why I try to be respectful of time. But what I will do is, I will make sure I get through everything I'm, going, I'm supposed to do. So I will manage it so I don't leave you hanging. <laughs> the spirit is high, and it's like you, you're looking at the watch. Jesus didn't look at no watch. No, he, he didn't, because he controlled. I can't control time like he can. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah. If Jesus tells the sun to stand still, it's going to stand still. I ain't got that kind of thought. No, I, 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 yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly, believe you me. I don't disagree with you one bit. I, I, I agree with you that we should not worry about time. You know, we should try to get done what needs to be done so we can learn what needs to be learned. I, I mean, I agree with you. I don't disagree with you one bit. I was just explaining to you why I don't do it. You know, but, but I have no problem doing it. You know, I, I, mean, I, I have no problem, you know, keep, keep going. You know, I, I really don't. So, you know, we're, 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 yeah, we're working somewhere in between, you, you know, you know. So, you know. It's going to be like my mom church. Well, that's, like well, that, that was, uh, uh, what, 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 my, what, what, what my sister is pointing out is that if you're going to sleep on me, then the, the spirit won't leave you. <laughs> no, it'll be about two hours. That'd be like. Yeah, no, I, I can't go for two hours. Uh, no. Uh, But but I but I understand what you're saying. I do. Okay. Be, be, okay. So so my second point. Okay. So the first thing was what I was talking about. What you know those those religious leaders, right? Who 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 their 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 goal is not to edify. At least the appearances. Their goal is not to edify Christ, but to line their pockets with money. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing. The, the second thing is you know from a practical standpoint, trying every spirit. Okay because we have a tendency not to do that, you know? And I say that, that that's problematic in, in our personal lives when we don't try every spirit, okay? Because here's what oftentimes you'll find, that someone will come into your life brand new, okay? And they will have all the appearance of being a sweet-spirited person, you know? And then you'll let them get close to you. And then once they get close to you, it's too late to push them back. And then you'll find out once they get close to you, once they know all your dirt, that they weren't as sweet as you thought they were. 
but now it's too late. Now you're in pain because they hurt you deeply. And sometimes we'll let the person that's brand new to our circle, you know, cause us to stop talking with somebody who we've been knowing all our life, you know. And then we realize that the devil was in the new person and we just didn't realize it. So you got to try folks. You got to try the spirit, you know. And, and here's what I would say, tell anybody. You, you, can, you, can, you can fake it, but not forever. See, if you can do fake who they are for, for a brief period of time, but they can't fake it forever. So don't rush into any relationship, whether it be just a mere friendship or whether it be a partnership. You want to make sure you give a person every opportunity to show who they are, you know. Okay, it's just like we say about, uh, you know, uh, water pipes, right? Pressure, pressure bus pipes. Wait till they get some pressure on them and then see how they act. If you don't see a person through pressure, you haven't seen them yet, you know? Okay. All right, so verse 4 says this. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore they therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Okay? Now, if you again, if we go back to what I just said, right? You know, this first premise is what? Ye are of God, right? When it says you have overcome them, he's saying what? You are greater than they are. So why would you listen to them? Why would you go about what people say when you have a closer relationship with God than they do? Okay? Because what they are teaching or preaching is worldly concepts. Okay? And I'll go back to what I said initially. People who are preaching sowing a seed, is that a what where is that in the Bible where if you sow a seed to their ministry, that you're gonna get blessed from up on high? Nowhere. See, that's a worldly concept. Really, you know what it is? You ever heard of a pyramid scheme? That's all it is. It's a, it, it is a, 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 a similar concept to a pyramid scheme. That's basically what it is. Okay? And so he's saying, what? Why would you go with them when you, are, you, have, you have the ability to overcome all the things they are talking about because that's a worldly thing they're putting out to you. And you've got God on your side. Okay? We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. All right? We are of God. We are of God. And then there is what? What's, what's that grammatical thing following that? Colon. Right? You know what you call it? Okay. Which means what? Everything that follows that is based on the first concept. Right? We are of God. Boom. So now this is what you know to be a fact. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Meaning what? People. People that have the spirit of God in them. Will, you will always be able to connect to. People that don't have the spirit of God in them. If you use your inner spirit. It will be evident about who they are. Because when it say heareth us, it doesn't mean, you know, just hear with an ear. You ever talk to somebody and it just ain't clicking? That's what he's referring to. It's kind of when someone says, you know, I see you. What do they mean when they say I see you? Or they say I'm glad you see me. They really mean what? We connect. Or you understand me. And that's the similar language what he's using here. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're just listening to me. Just like to see someone doesn't mean you just put your eyes on them. It means what? We connect. And so he's saying the same thing, that we who are of God, we connect. 
And those who are not of God, you, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you know sometimes, you can be around somebody, and they can be in church, and you will feel a little funny. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, it would be like something, yeah, you know. But you, know, when you, but you just say to yourself sometimes, well, they're Christians, you know, they belong to the church, so, you know, it must be all right. You can't, like, override what the Spirit just told you. You know, later on you pay for it, but you override it at first, right? And, and that's what he's saying, all right? So we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, okay? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love, okay? So in the first part, he explains to us our salvation. In the second part, he tells us, hey, here is the barometer. Here's how you know that you have met what you need to meet. Because if God loves and we aspire to be like God, that means we should love. Right? And how do we love? In word? Actions. actions. So our love ought to be displayed with our actions. And, and, and again, when the question was raised, hey, well, why don't people, why isn't the church crowded? The church isn't crowded because we don't necessarily show love to people. If, if you think about the Christians that you know, even in this body in Enoch Baptist Church, and we can be honest, is, is anyone here for the first time? No, so we can be honest with each other, right? At least we ought to be honest with each other, right? Do you feel loved? by everyone in this church you come into contact with? No. no. You know. But we say what? God is love. Do you feel love by every usher that tried to sit you down? No. But you what? We say God. God is love. Right? Do you feel love by every minister in this church? Yeah. You scared to answer? <laughs> I ain't gonna get mad. <laughs> Huh? No, I know she's on you. No, we're not. Right, okay, see, what they tell true shame the devil, right? No. And I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you this is a good example, all right? Now, this is what Okay. Uh, Brother Bird, how many ministers are in this church? See, that's my point to you, right? Yeah. How can you say to me that you feel loved by every minister and you don't even know how many ministers there are? Yeah. You don't even know who they are. How can you be in a place that says God is love and that the epitome, that, excuse me, not the epitome, but just the, 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 the evidence that God is love is that I show you, I show you love, not tell you, but show you love. Now, wouldn't it be reasonable to say that the ministers ought to be the leaders in showing love? Yeah. Well, if how in the world can I show you love and you don't even know that I exist? If I show you love right, you would know it. Because all of them like to brag on that they evangelists, so and so and so and so. They reverend so and so and so and so. They minister so and so and so and so. Tell the truth, shame the devil. I'm just saying, I'm not going to take up for them. I didn't, I didn't point out who they were in particular, right? How many do we have? On record, 18. The question is not, are they active? The question is, do they love? Well, I mean, if I just come to church and I'm a minister. Well, that's okay. Again, that's my point, right? If, if, if the concept of the commandment is that you show love, right? If that's the concept, that, well, ain't the concept. Let me read it again. Come on, man. Maybe I missed it. Beloved, love, let us love one another, right? Isn't it what it says? 
For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? Because God is love. Isn't that what it says? What should I say to these things? If the Bible says that the that the that the that the representation of who I am is based on me showing you love, and I'm not showing you love, then won't that shouldn't that suggest that I'm not doing this? And if I was doing this, wouldn't you know? Well, I'm right here because for, let me give you for example, right? For example. When doing the prayer time, this is just an example. And this is not to put anyone in a negative light. It's just I'm trying to give you some example I'm coming from, okay? Because it's not just the ministers. I'm just picking on them right now. It's really, you know what? The host of people, everybody. How many times during the prayer have you seen them list the people who are sick and shut in? Every week, right? Yeah. Every week, yeah. Have any of you all ever been sick in this church? Did you get a call from 18 ministers saying, how you doing? You got called one. Oh, my goodness. Just one? Just one show? Of What's he? Pastor, you didn't call me, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but I prayed for you, though. <laughs> but, hey, hey, but, but, but wouldn't that be showing you love? Right. I'm just saying. Now, is that, is that to say that what, every one of them has to call everybody? No, but shouldn't somebody else be calling? Shouldn't somebody else be saying how you doing? Shouldn't, some, shouldn't somebody else be doing something if you are called to the ministry? Right? If you are called to the ministry, then coming and sitting in the pew is not showing love, except for the pew. I love my pew. Okay, I'll move on. <laughs> so he says, John says, that he that loveth not knoweth not God. Now, what is he saying here? Two things. Number one, here's what I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to give you the practical pride of it. They don't understand God. When you don't show love, you don't, uh, if, if love is not the principal thing that's guiding you, you don't understand God. When he says you don't know, that's what he's saying. You don't understand, right? Okay, because how can I, okay, for, if you know, if you know, if you believe, let me say it differently, if you believe the Bible, Let's say you are a minister. I'm picking on the ministers because they're the ones who had the most, what, maturity. If I pick on the ushers too much, they're going to get mad and walk out. But the ministers are supposed to have maturity, they ain't going to go in the way, right? Why? They mature, okay? So that's why I'm picking on them, okay? Now, here's what the scripture says, right? If we do what we just learned from chapter 3, it says... And whatsoever, beloved, if we love God, right, whatsoever we ask, we receive of God. Because we keep his commandment and do the things that are pleasing, right? That's what it says. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment, right? Now, so if I believe God's word, that means I believe that if I do these things, I can get whatever I need from and want from God. Right? right. If I believe that, wouldn't it make sense for me to want to do more of that? Yeah. So if I'm not doing more of that, either one of two things is true. I don't know the Bible or I don't believe the Bible. Now, which one would you like me to believe about them? 
that they don't believe or they don't know? They don't know. That they don't know. And that's what John says. You don't know God like you think you do. Because if you did, you would act differently. This is just really just that straightforward yeah. stuff. Yeah. So it's a, but but it, it still put it cascades where all the way down. It's not just for the ministers. It cascades to everybody. I'm just using them because the, that their light is the one that's easier for me to say what the switch is off. Right. Right. Okay. Because they're the ones that say what I know the word. Yeah. Okay. Are we 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 good? We good? Yeah. Okay. All right, verse 9 says, In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now, note how he lays that out. Note how he lays it out. And this was manifest the love of God toward us. Meaning what? To be manifest means to do what? To demonstrate that which I have said. He said, this is how God showed you that he truly loved you. Right? Now, what did he do to show you he loved you? He gave his only son. He sacrificed something most precious to demonstrate that I truly love you. Right? Now, he's also telling us what? Herein is love. God did it first. Right? Not, not we did it for him, but he did it for us first. Yeah. But that he loved us and sent his son. Beloved, if God loved us, we ought to love somebody else. So he said if God did that for us, we ought to do the same thing to show love. So if God sacrificed what he treasured the most, we should be willing to sacrifice what we treasure the most to show love. Because if you are not doing that, then it says what? You don't either know God or you don't believe God. Because if you believe God, you are perfectly willing to give up that which means the most to show somebody that you love them. Because you know if you do that, God will give you whatever you ask from him. If you believe. And if you know it, you'll do it. So there are only two things we can conclude, that either you don't believe it or you don't know it. Now, now that you know it, the question is, are you going to believe it? God just told us, now you ain't no excuse. Because now you know it. But the question now becomes, do you believe it? Hmm? People saying yes. But the question is, are you going to act on it? Are you now going to sacrifice the things most precious to you to show your love to somebody else? Say, we'll try. Now, I'll go with that. We'll try. Why? And then we're going to say what I said three minutes ago, right? If my heart condemned me, God is greater than my heart. And if my heart condemned me not, then that says what? I have faith in my God, right? Because that's, and that's why, that's why all that's thrown in there that way. He's telling you what you're supposed to do. He's telling you what will show God that you really believe him and that you really know him. But he also knows for human beings, it's hard to give up what you care the most about to show love. That's why we can't forgive people. Because to forgive you is to give me. And I love me more than I love you. You understand what I'm saying? That's why we can't forgive for them. See, if you didn't love yourself more, it would be easy for you to forgive. But because you love yourself more, you're saying, well, the pain you caused me, I can't let that go. Because you treasure yourself more than you treasure the other person. You don't treasure yourself more than you treasure your children. Right or wrong. You'll give up your life for your children. And because you treasure them more, you will give up you for them. But because you don't treasure the other way around, you're saying, well, Lord, forgive me, but I can't. I can't do it now. Okay? Yeah. Amen. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Yeah. 
No man have seen God at any time. Meaning what? In the, in the, in the, what? the fullness of who God is. Right? No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. Now, no man has seen God at any time. Why do you think he would drop that in there talking about love? Okay, I'll tell you God. Absolutely. He said, you have never seen God, but you will do everything you can do to prove that you love God. Now, I'm not saying you really do love him, but I say what? You do everything you can do to try to prove that you love him. Right? For example, okay, how many of you all have been in Bible study since I've opened the church back up? Come pretty much, yeah, they come every week, but pretty much every week, right? Now, how many of you have spent this much time trying to repair a relationship that was broken? That you've been over their house or calling them up every week for an hour trying to show them that you love them? Not a one of us, have we? Isn't that something? But we say, what, you love God who you ain't seen, and the person that you used to be friends with for the last 20 years did something hurt your feelings, and you won't even spend another hour trying to amend that relationship. You just say it's over with. You ain't never kicking the head. Yeah. Everybody in here ought to be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. Can't let it go, can you? No. Thank God for that. Remember I told you I said what? Chapter 3 was my chapter? Because if my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. And if it condemn me not, okay, let's move on then. That's what it's saying basically. All right? But that's the, that's the fact. And that's the reality of who we are, right? and how we treasure stuff that doesn't make sense. Folk, you know, listen, think about how many family, I mean, I mean DNA family, I don't mean church family, I mean DNA. They got your DNA from somebody. You know, you do a test right now and we know you are related. And folk refuse to, what? Talk to each other. Grew up together. Now you can't talk to each other. Yeah. All right. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit, right? And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And so he says what? That we know that what? God gave Christ because he loved us, right? And for Christ to die meant that he loved us. For us to love Christ and love what he did for us is to accept that he did it out of love for us. And when we accept he did it out of love for us, it causes us to love him back, right? Because those who give great sacrifices to show their love, you love them back. And he said, because of that, we become intertwined together, right? Because that's how it is. And we know that be the truth. Okay? You ever with me so far? And I know you told me to look at my watch, but I got to look at it anyhow. Uh, okay. No, that's on Sunday. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> so I'm just going to do one more first thing. <laughs> Since it's Wednesday. Since it's Wednesday. Since y'all got to go to work tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. So I'll pause right there. So here's what he's saying then. It's simple. He's saying, listen. The connection that we that he's just talked about between God, the Father, God, the Son, and 
through us. Without that relationship, we as human beings would always have an imperfectness in how we show love. We can't even love God the way God wants to be loved on our own, okay? And the only way you can love God the way God wants to be loved is because of the spirit that God has placed in you that will bond with his spirit. You couldn't even connect with God if God didn't decide to connect with you first, okay? It's, it's kind of like um, a, a mother and a child, right? How, how, how does a child get the bond with the mother? Who, who, is the, who, who precipitates that relationship? The mother. If the mother does not, if the mother does not hold the child close, if the mother does not uh, 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 take care of the child when the child is sick, if the mother does not show love, the child will never develop that love for the mother. Right? That's right? It's always that, that person that, that brings it off first. It is the same way with us and God. If God hadn't done it, the love couldn't have been perfected because we wouldn't have understood what love was. And without the spirit, you couldn't love God's spirit because the devil would be controlling you so much, you would hate God. Okay, you right good? All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna pause right there then and uh, we'll pick up uh, uh, chapter 4 and verse 18. We've covered, look at just boom. Start on 318, come back, we're on 418. See how that works? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and guess what time it is? 801. 801. I stopped at 8 o'clock, but he to jump at 801 after the fact. So I'm going to stop right on time. Start watching my clock, okay? All right. Let's, uh, don't forget what? Tomorrow, if you want a basket, please come up and get one. 2 o'clock, they should be ready, all right? Now that you know what love is all about, you're going to start loving each other, praying for each other. When you see some names up there, you're going to call some folk up every once in a while and say, hey, I'm just praying for you, let you know I love you, right? When you see somebody need a seat, you might want to stand up sometimes. I know you need a seat. Go ahead and take my seat, right? And we're going to show some love, right? So because we want everybody to want to come back to church, right? We're going to stop talking about people. Well, okay, we ain't going to do that. We won't do that. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't ask you too much. <laughs> All right, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's pray out. Father, we thank you tonight for being who you are. Thank you for blessing us with your word. And thank you, Lord, for putting your protective edge around us. I ask now, God, you would direct our pathway that we may walk in a way that will bring honor to your name. Bless us as we leave this place. See us safely to our appointed destinations. And allow God, each of us, to come back again to worship and praise your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Y'all have, have a wonderful day. Let me tell you one thing.